Durga, thank you for joining us again. It's great to talk to you, uh, to you one again. more time. So I want to jump right in. Uh, I love having Qualcomm here because you bring an international perspective, and that's where I'd, I'd like to start. You know, as countries around the world are expanding um, their 5G networks, they're progressing towards 5G advanced, um, what are some of the international trends you're seeing, and what are the implications for us in the U.S.? So, good question, by the way. It's uh, year six of 5G. It's, uh, I think we launched 5G in spring of 2019, so uh, it's about the right time to take stock of the situation. Uh, I'll give my perspectives, uh, both from an international and what we are seeing in the US, uh, specifically focusing on China, because that does actually come in quite a lot. At this midpoint in 5G, we've seen a proliferation of uh, both experimentation of new services and new kinds of features that are coming in. We've moved past the initial phase of the evolution of 5G towards fixed wireless access going into other domains. Uh, this means into categories which are below smartphones. Uh, this is called as reduced capability. So instead of the gigabit per second or tens of gigabits per second, you're talking of hundreds of megabits per second data rates. That's something that's very essential when it comes to uh, always connected XR devices uh, as we go into the future. Uh, and uh, But the biggest, I, I would say that the biggest application of that is really in the industrial sector. So that's reduced capability devices. The other one that's becoming increasingly popular now is uh, actually a throwback from where we left off in the 90s, which is satellite communications. It's now integrated as a part of uh, 3GPP standards. And when you take a look at every single device uh, that we have, as a complement to terrestrial service, uh, the uh, uh, ability to have SATCOM-based uh, uh, either telemetry or primitive um, uh, text messaging services, or when it comes to industrial applications, when you have uh, you know oil pipelines and so on out in the nowhere where you don't have any connectivity, the ability to connect to, to the network. So that's like another dimension that has taken off. This is very different from bread and butter, mobile broadband, pushing the speeds uh, significantly. There is a third dimension, and that is on, uh, as we take a look at the evolution of where we left off with uh, uh, what used to be called as, remember back in the day, six years uh, earlier, we had this triangle of mobile broadband, uh, machine type communications, which is where a lot of the uh, IoT applications came in, and latency sensitive applications. So that's a place where there's a, there's a rethinking in terms of what needs to be done in that space. But that's the broader perspective. In China, there's an experimentation on practically every single one of these services. In the US, we're beginning to see that. Uh, but uh, it's very nice to see fixed wireless access take off in a good way. Well, you just ended with fixed wireless access, and I suspect that might be the answer, part of the answer to this next question, which is, well, from your perspective, which 5G applications are really, truly delivering? And, and you know, looking ahead the next 12 months, what do you think are the most promising coming use cases? So keeping aside all the POCs and all the R&D uh, demos and activities and trials that are going on, just in terms of a raw business model, I think fixed wireless access has now become mainstream part of cellular. It's not the first time we've done it. It used to be the case in 3G. It was okay. 4G took a little bit more. But with 5G, I think we've truly delivered in terms of fixed wireless access. The promise of that and the number of households that have been connected using uh, wireless services is just absolutely amazing. And I think in the US, we've done a really good job from the mobile community across both devices, infrastructure vendors, and the mobile operators who have done a tremendous job in this space. Uh, that's clearly a success story uh, in the US. Uh, if I take a look at China and some of the other markets, by the way, in Japan also, there's a lot of fixed wireless access mm -hmm. that occurs, but it used to be there in 4G. It's taken a bigger way with 5G. Uh, in China, I think a lot of the, there are actual applications in the industrial domain. That's a place where uh, I would argue that the services have taken off. It's hard to kind of see what's the actual business model associated with it. But uh, coming back to the US, I think fixed wireless access, it's a slam dunk in terms of which is the best possible service that we've seen outside traditional mobile broadband. And, and looking ahead? Looking ahead, I would actually argue that uh, wearables and connected devices is probably the most promising area. Now, I'm talking about it in the context of POCs and trials that we have seen. Uh, if you've seen the, you know, the, the Ray-Ban, Meta Ray-Ban glasses, mm -hmm. uh, if you've used it, it's, pre it's pretty nice. And I've always kind of, when I use them, Bluetooth connectivity to your phone, it's a natural next step to go from there towards just connected directly to the network where you will use the phone when necessary as a hub, but otherwise not really necessary. I think that's probably 
most promising in terms of where we can go. It still needs to evolve in the right direction. Okay. So now we've already had a few speakers touch on AI. Yes. And I want to talk a little bit more about that. AI is becoming deeply embedded in the network from RAN optimization to user experiences, which you touched on. Um, how is Qualcomm thinking about this? How are you approaching it? And then thinking more broadly about the industry here in the US, um, what do we need to do to prep uh, and pave the way for an AI native 6G? So uh, first of all, there's two aspects to it. Uh, one is what's happening with AI in devices, and the other part is what's happening with AI in networks. This is before we talk about 6G. In other words, there's no actual specifications that's written down. These are proprietary mechanisms, AI algorithms making their way into cellular communications. By the way, it's a very important transition point, so I want to spend maybe a couple of minutes on this. First on devices. Uh, historically, we've, we've kind of always had like our algorithms that run on devices just to make your performance ca uh, captured in the form of latency, your uh, data rates, your average data rates, sellage data rates, and so on, looking much better than before, we would rely upon cellular algorithms. Increasingly, we are beginning to use AI models to improve the same algorithm. So in other words, we're doing the same thing that we used to do before, except we are using AI models, which happen to do much better. A lot of the algorithms that are usually used are fine-tuned and handcrafted uh, with years of experience. But it turns out that with AI, we can do even better. Same thing happened with image processing and cameras. Uh, the, it's happening in devices as well. So the chances are, if you have a Qualcomm-powered smartphone in your hands right now, we are using AI as we speak for a lot of things that you might not know of. And as Qualcomm, we are on our... Uh, We've gone beyond the third generation of our AI processor that's embedded within the modem in itself. It's a, you know, we talk about it in, in other forums, but it's already happening. There's no need for standardization in that. Similarly, when it comes to network optimization, uh, RAN agents are making a gradual appearance within the network in itself. A tremendous amount of data that get, gets ingested, and if you want to optimize the network performance, then use AI algorithms to optimize that just in terms of network parameter setting and whatnot. But that actually brings us to the next stage of AI as to what does it mean. So far, it's like proprietary optimizations. Is that what it is? Our belief is no. Uh, when we talk of, uh, we need to put some, uh, you know, something concrete when it comes to what does AI native 6G networks actually mean. This means you have well-defined protocols that are standardized. That means devices and networks are communicating with each other, fully understanding that you do have AI algorithms running in your network, you do have AI algorithms running in the device. What is the nature of communicating? Okay, what are you using versus what data gets communicated back and forth? That's the definition of an AI native network. For that to happen, you have to be able to handle the workloads on both sides, which means the processors need to upgrade both on devices and on networks. This would be like an upgrade in terms of the network processing capability. Today, when we talk of AI in the network, we typically mean somewhere in the deep cloud, but there's an opportunity to bring that closer and closer to the end user, uh, which means that we have the potential for AI services, whether it's compute as a service, not just data as a service, but compute as a service. This is, of course, the holy grail of where we need to be with 6G. But that's what is the definition of a AI native 6G network. These are seed thoughts. We have another four years or so before through the standardization process, something will come out of it. But as that plays itself out, nobody is waiting for standards by themselves. All the optimizations are occurring as we speak. So now we're here in Washington. Uh, let's bring this discussion back, back home. Now, earlier you spoke about, and I'll paraphrase, how China is taking a sort of maximalist approach, right? They're pushing forward 5G applications yeah. across industries. As our Global competitors are scaling up 5G, accelerating their spectrum deployments. China may have four times more mid-band than we do. What steps uh, should we be thinking about, those of us here in Washington, you know, as we, we think about the policies to move us forward? What, what do we need to do? So I think there's a couple of things over here. As a cellular uh, telecom operator community and, and uh, uh, infrastructure and device community, uh, we need to be part of the national conversation on AI itself. If AI as a technology is going to be permeating both the networks and devices, we need to be a part of that. That goes a little beyond spectrum, but it is something that's important. Why does it matter? Well, it matters because as policies come in, in terms of these are the guardrails that you need to have on AI, but the same guardrails will apply inside devices and in networks as well. Tomorrow, we might have the notion of autonomous networks, networks that are capable of running themselves with AI agents that are running. So if those guardrails are applicable, what are they? So there is a conversation that occurs and uh, you know, it's, it's needed. Similarly, on devices, as devices are taking more and more autonomous actions by themselves. One thing to notice is that 
and I've noticed this in China, uh, Chinese operators are gradually evolving themselves into, they're not just mobile operators providing data as a service, but they're increasingly going into the cloud and becoming like cloud players. It's some mix and match of both, if you will, with additional services that are coming up uh, to their own consumers. So I think from a leadership perspective in the US, we definitely want to be a part of that. Up, as that upgrade cycle comes up, we want to be embedded into the AI conversations from a cellular community. And um, any thoughts on how we can uh, you know, make our networks robust enough to support all of that? Well, first of all, as we upgrade the networks itself with the processors that are needed to be able to run AI workloads, both in networks and in devices, the other thing is, let's not underestimate the importance of spectrum as we get to 6G. Look, we did what we could with 5G. And, and if I were to go back in time and say, should we have done a few things differently? I would argue, yeah, we could have done a few things differently. Extremely important to have clean spectrum for us as we march into 6G, and we need tons of it. There's never going to be enough of that. It is very important to understand that. AI is a piece of the puzzle. It doesn't actually suddenly diminish the need for spectrum for ourselves. So it's important to pay attention to both sides. Well, Durga, thank you so much. Uh, we really love having you here. I really appreciate hearing Thanks your for thoughts. Having me.